Can you hear me, Nate? Oh, yep. There you are. Sorry, Shadeen. Uh, go ahead with an intro if you want. Okay. Welcome to the Baltimore SharePoint Users Group. Since 2007, we have existed in Greater Baltimore with the express purpose to solve problems, challenges for the uh, SharePoint and Office 365 and related platforms. I am your uh, host and organizer, Shad Didi Laser, and each each third Thursday of the month, Baltimore SharePoint user groups meets at uh, Pro Object. We'd like to thank uh, Ted as well as Pro Object for providing the venue for our monthly meetings. This month, without further ado, we want to uh, get directly to the topic at hand. We have uh, SharePoint wizardry for uh, content management, and there are very few people in the world who I would, uh, uh, would love to express this topic. And so we have Nate Chamberlain all the way from the Midwest delivering uh, his unique flavor of uh, SharePoint. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Baltimore SharePoint overall, as we have two new members in the room, uh, we also host uh, SharePoint Saturday Baltimore, which is a one day free conference where we bring in speakers from all over the world. Uh, to cover uh, SharePoint in as many flavors from administrative, project management, and user on down the line. And so Nate is a uh, two-time uh, speaker, so came from the Midwest over to Greater Baltimore to deliver his knowledge. So he is part of the uh, fraternity here at uh, Baltimore SharePoint. And so it's a great honor that he took the time to uh, put together this presentation for our audience. So this is being recorded so it can be uh, shared on demand. So uh, within the room, Nate, we have um, a note sheet that uh, people can take as far as ideas to take back to their organization, uh, key takeaways as well, and uh, content management strategies. So as you're going down the presentation, there's a, a sheet that they can uh, fill out that's for the uh, individuals in the room. So I'm going to turn it over to you. If there are questions during the presentation, I will use the chat and uh, facilitate the questions to you as they come up. Take it away. That sounds great. Thanks, Shadid. All right, let me get settled here. Um, if anybody can't see the uh, slide with Baltimore SharePoint user group and my face on it, just let me know. Might be a setting that's tweaked. Uh, but I'll go ahead and get started and I'll watch for that just in case it comes up. All right, so quick intro on me. Uh, like Shadid said, um, I've been a part of uh, SharePoint Saturday Baltimore a couple times now. Um, I always enjoy coming out there and it's just interesting to see all the different industries that we can see across the country. And it seems when I'm out there, there's a lot of government presence, um, of course, and here in the Midwest, maybe not so much. <laughs> so here I work at a hospital, LMH Health, uh, formerly Lawrence Memorial Hospital, where I'm a SharePoint Systems Engineer. Um, I'm also a new uh, Microsoft MVP as of February, and I'm a certified um, or Microsoft certified O365 um, expert here. Um, of course, everything changes so frequently, it's hard to <laughs> consider that a month later. Anyway, uh, I have a blog, SharePointLibrarian.com. It's where I share uh, thoughts on career growth, or thoughts on uh, SharePoint, Office 365, um, I imagine in a few years it won't be called SharePoint Librarian anymore. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter, um, you can always email me if you'd like. Also, I run the Lawrence SharePoint User Group. We're a hybrid group that um, always meets and broadcasts live online, uh, as well as records. So if you're not in the Midwest near Kansas, we can always get you involved in another way. All right, a little background on me. Um, People call me SharePoint Nate at work. They got me this bright green chartreuse hat, so I try to take that around with me so I don't get lost. Um, I've written two books, The ABCs of SharePoint and Rise of the Advocates. Uh, Rise of the Advocates is a new one. It's a free. So if you want to go out to, um, I think it's SharePointEurope.com, they have a resource center where you can get that. It's about, just about 32 pages, uh, but just some ideas to get you thinking about um, how you could build some kind of advocate program in your workplace if you don't have one or improve the ones that you do have. Uh, I'm a graduate of Emporia State University with my master's in library science. 
Um, I used to work at the University of Kansas, so I have an education background, and currently I'm in healthcare, like I said, at LMH Health. Okay, so uh, how I got into this um, content strategy and content management um, it kind of inspired me to do this presentation because there's just so much out there that um, I feel is happening to every industry where we have this content that just piles up year after year and there's a fear, just an underlying um, fear that stuff, if we delete it, it's going to cause trouble for us. But um, in reality, the longer we latch on to some things, we're causing trouble for ourselves uh, when it gets into e-discovery and we have just thousands of files that we could have at some point gotten rid of, but we kept and now they're just part of this bigger risk, really. Um, but we don't always see it that way. Sometimes it's just I want to make sure I can find it. I want to make sure I have access to it. Uh, so that's kind of how I started. I was at KU Libraries and we had a completely HTML intranet. Um, we wanted to move to Office 365. So in that top screenshot, you can see where it was very text heavy, very link heavy. Um, and then we moved to Office 365 um, and that was my start into SharePoint. So with that, a complete change of uh, platform and everything, we had an opportunity to go through all this content. And a lot of questions about content management and content strategy came up. Um, it was a massive project. We're talking about you know, over a decade of data uh, and what to do with that and how to organize that in a way that was safe and also adhered to the state's retention policies and such. Uh -oh. There we go. Okay, uh, then I moved to LMH Health. We were uh, SharePoint 2013. We migrated to SharePoint 2016. We're about to migrate again to SharePoint 2019 Hybrid 0365. Um, so it's just constant change. I love that. It's uh, To me, it's continual improvement. So we're seeing uh, this content management story evolve over time. And something we're going to get to in a little bit is how Office 365 differs so much now from our on-prem instances that it gives us so much more power, it seems, to do some of these uh, data loss prevention things and um, talking about archiving and retention in a new way where previously we had to do a lot of different uh, manual work to get some of this to work. Now it's so much of it is automated or suggested to us where just in a few clicks we've created a pretty robust uh, retention policy um, or a data loss prevention policy. All right, so before we get started, if there are any questions, like Shadid said, he'll watch the chat there. Um, I'll be glancing at it every now and then as well, uh, but we'll go ahead and get started with content management. Uh, content management to me um, isn't necessarily a, a verb, but it's more of an umbrella. So to me, content management includes content strategy, archiving, and retention. So we're gonna talk about um, each of those three. They're my pillars, you might say, of content management. Um, when we're thinking about these, also think about your role that you play in your organization. So if you're the Microsoft 365 Admin Center, you're bigger than SharePoint. And some of the stuff we're going to talk about applies to Teams and it applies to Exchange, um, especially when we're thinking about labels and sensitivity. So uh, if you are the Microsoft 365 Admin, you've got that Security and Compliance Center, which every time I check it, it's a little bit different. So <laughs> we're going to look at it today. It's going to differ from the screenshots you see there. Um, but I think last time I checked, there was a security center and a compliance center, and the link for each took you to the same page. So we'll see what's in the store for us today. Um, like I said, it applies to more than SharePoint. You get your service assurance reports. Uh, it's where you can get your search and investigation. Something that was new to me anyway about two years ago maybe was the secure score. I just It's not something that's uh, completely scientific all the way down, but it gives you an idea. It's a starting place. Just like with any data, any kind of Power BI dashboard that you're working with, uh, the secure uh, score is going to tell you a story that allows you to make an informed decision. But of course, it's not something that you should base your entire decision on. It's just one piece of a consideration. Uh, so data loss prevention and data governance then would be the last piece for the Microsoft 365 admin. Uh, and we're going to get into more detail with those, so I won't spend too much time there. If you're the SharePoint admin, you have just a few things we're going to talk about. Uh, creating archives or send to locations. Um, this is kind of a dated thing now. It still applies very much to on-prem people, so that might be something you're, you're interested in. Um, also, you get all the usage reports. So um, for me, that the biggest impact there is just knowing what people are searching for that they're not finding um, or things that they're searching for and they're giving up on. Um, so really interesting stuff that can help with your content management in a different way where we're not necessarily moving content, but we're, we're uh, surfacing it and making it easier for people to find. 
um, by understanding what they're looking for, what the intended result is, and then using promoted results or uh, result blocks to bring that to the front. Uh, site collection admins then, uh, this is probably the more um, numerous population. We've got uh, term store management for synonyms. Uh, this is um, largely for me, it's been an on-premises ex experience. Then you've got your popularity and search reports, which are a light version of the usage reports from the SharePoint admin perspective. Uh, you get the site and site collection features. We're going to talk about two that are particular uh, particular to the, um, let's see, the, more of the on-prem experience. So we've got, um, so if you're thinking about retention policies and such, what you might need to activate there. Uh, and then workflows for archive and retention. So you can always use Flow to move things around. Uh, you can use SharePoint Designer if you're on-prem. You can use it if you're in O365, but you just got to get it configured correctly and make sure that it's okay with your admins. Um, so lots of options. You can see every role kind of looks at this differently or has different capabilities. So I hope I can cover um, the important parts for you depending on your role. All right, so the first piece of this puzzle, uh, content strategy, is your solemn swear to get and stay organized. Um, and I hope there was once upon a time I gave this presentation and I asked if there were Harry Potter fans in the audience and there was just one or two and I was shocked because it's always been such a, a big part of my life. So to see that, I was like, oh no, I'm either getting old or I'm too young or I'm somewhere stuck in the middle. <laughs> I'm not sure. So I hope in that audience there in Baltimore today that we have some Harry Potter fans to get some of these uh, references and enjoy these gifts. Um, so anyway, content strategy moving on here. So if you didn't know, uh, no matter what your role is that we just talked about, you're also a content strategist. Uh, so what that means is that um, we're talking about a lot of settings, we're talking about features, uh, we're talking about rules and data loss prevention policies, and a lot of this is kind of, it kind of has a negative connotation to it, like nobody wants to be audited, nobody wants to have e-discovery on their content, um, but it happens. But you're also a content strategist, which means outside of these settings, outside of all of these policies and legal terms, um, you're helping your organization uh, understand the content that they're producing, helping them store it in a place that uh, makes sense and is accessible to people. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what that means um, and how you might think about content strategy the next time you have a chance to sit down with an end user. All right, so a required textbook, if there were to be any in this presentation, would be content strategy for the web. Um, I learned about it when I went to an internet pros group and someone brought it up and it sounded like the most bland book you could read. And I'm a library science major, I love to read, but Content strategy for the web, uh, that was a bit iffy. So uh, here we are, all of a sudden, it's my required textbook, so I hope that tells you something. But it actually is an enjoyable read, and it's not a long read, it's a short book. It's got um, to-the-point knowledge that you can use and implement right away. I mean, it really helped me understand, especially in that big project I talked about first, going from completely HTML to um, an O365 environment, it helped me understand uh, the kind of stuff we were working with and the importance of it or the lack of importance of it. Um, so content strategy, if you're not familiar, uh, is defined in this book by how an organization or a project will use its content to achieve its objectives and meet its users' needs. Okay, inside the book, this graphic you'll see a lot. Uh, it divides uh, content strategy into two halves. The blue half there is content, so what is the substance and how is it structured? And on the red half, you've got your workflow and your governance. So you've got your people components there, uh, which we usually work with the most. A lot of us in IT don't have to think about substance so much. We think a lot about structure. Uh, but then workflow and governance, we're kind of in the middle there, helping to facilitate uh, the journey of content from creation to uh, distribution or to retention or to deletion. Uh, so a little bit deeper here um, into content, you know, what substance is, what is the content that you need and why? Structure is where are you going to put it? Um, how is it formatted? Do you have um, any kind of department structure? Are you more project-based? Um, and then within each of those, do you have one document library to rule them all or do you have multiple? Um, so th there's a lot of considerations here and this book kind of walks you through each of these and it helps you think about your specific industry and your organization and your structure and your content that you have already and seeing if that's truly suiting your needs and speaking to your uh, users. So then people, workflow, uh, to me as an IT person, as a SharePoint person, workflow means SharePoint designer, it means uh, Microsoft Flow. Uh, but it's not always necessarily the way um, content strategy sees it. It also includes the motion of people and the work that you know starts today and ends at Z and involves six people 
what is the Visio diagram you're creating for the actual work uh, that creates this content? Who approves it? Who uh, edits it? Who's responsible for distributing it to the local newspaper? That kind of stuff. But we're not all marketing, so we'll keep going here. Uh, governance, so how are key decisions about content and content strategy made? Um, and how are changes initiated and communicated? So the book I just released was important to me because it kind of captured a lot of the thoughts that I've run into in creating my own governance. Um, and a lot of that's just trial and error. You try things that work and then you implement them. And I wanted to capture before I forget everything someday, <laughs> what was working and what wasn't. Um, so with governance, hopefully you have a group of people already who are responsible for um, making important decisions about, you know, not necessarily your intranet. Um, there may be a day where we don't say intranet anymore. We're just talking about uh, collaboration and the tools that help us do that. So with governance, what are you truly governing? Is it the creation of content, the adherence to branding, or is it the, uh, the access to it, uh, the structure of it? Is it appropriate to put it in Teams or is it um, required that it's in SharePoint? Um, there's a ton of questions, especially as we see Office 365 evolve, uh, that governance can help you answer. It doesn't have to be centered in IT. Okay, so all of that to say, uh, we've got those content components and people components that the book recommends, um, and then we're going to add SharePoint and Office 365 to it to create uh, the rest of this presentation, which is content strategy and Office 365. Um, let's see here, I've got... Oh, awesome. I've got David who loves uh, Harry Potter analogies. Thank you. It makes me feel better. I am re-energized. All right. So down here, uh, SharePoint and Office 365, we've got permissions management. Uh, so this is something that we're introducing to those two halves of that core. So we're making a bigger pie here. Um, we're able to use automation via workflow. So we saw in people components that we had uh, workflow there. Now we're going to add a little bit of machinery to it and see how that can help us achieve our content strategy that we're talking about. Uh, templates and content types. So um, marketing is always big on adhering to branding, using the right logos, using the right formats. Um, templates and content types help you do that and it helps you uh, stay consistent in the way that you're distributing and soliciting information. And then your uh, retention policies. So um, it's so nice to have some of that stuff automated, especially when you think about turnover these days, where it's just becoming the norm that people stay a small number of years in one place before they move on. If your retention policy is seven years, you want to make sure that it's going to be something reliable, that when someone else leaves and you get someone new in to try to understand what was built before they left, um, that these retention policies, thanks to Office 365, are going to be functional, are functioning. And then uh, data loss prevention, which is now called data governance, as of who knows when. I hope it still is today. We'll find out. Uh, but a lot of those admin centers and the Microsoft 365 admin center, just watch those, see how their names change, and then um, get familiar with where your main tools are that are important to you. Um, for me specifically, for example, uh, compliance isn't such a big uh, deal for me. We have a compliance office, and I can use my tools to help that office. But my big concern or my primary focus is more on data loss prevention and data governance. Um, so you'll just kind of get familiar with the different admin centers and tools out there and just watch as they shift if you're 0365. Um, it's kind of fun to keep up with. All right. So any questions so far before we move past content strategy now that we've kind of defined that in the 0365 bubble? And um, for those of you who are new to GoToWebinar, um, there's a chat panel. There's also a questions panel. I'm not sure if both are available for you, but let's check that out. All right, let's venture forth and I'll keep watching that. So feel free to keep typing if you are. Uh, so archiving, um, some of these words we're going to talk about have multiple meanings to different people, and archiving is one of those words. Um, it's kind of like, um, oh, what was it we were just talking about? Let me think. Oh, um, so I had Sharon Weaver, who's the CEO of Smarter Consulting, speak for the Lawrence SharePoint user group recently. And uh, we were talking about, or she brought up the point that live data is a phrase that means different things to different people. So this is kind of like that to me where live data to one person may mean every 45 minutes, or it may mean every second to another person, um, but it really depends on your situation and how you, you know, once a day might even be live data for some people. 
So archiving is another thing. So when you think about archiving, some people are going to jump to a legal, uh, like a policy, something or other that says we have to archive this for seven years. Maybe they're actually talking about retention um, and they're stuck in a gray area. Um, some people think about archive from a library perspective. So we're going to archive this and have it in the historical archives, maybe frame it someday and bring it out in an exhibit. <laughs> Um, but um, before you even start talking about archiving with your group or your governance committee, um, it's good to just uh, come to terms to find some kind of common explanation for these. So before you say, how are we going to handle archiving, just ask, how are we going to define archiving for our group? Um, and then this quote's great, the ones who love us never really leave us, you can always find them in here. So that's from Harry Potter, and to me, this kind of brings us into archiving. So archiving means that um, even though we may have made something read-only or restricted access to something um, as a way of archiving it, it's still there. And maybe we even make it non-searchable anymore. We just put it in a different location, uh, soft storage, if you will, um, instead of putting it in the forefront in front of everyone. Okay, so archiving. Uh, moving files meeting a certain criteria to a staging location where they'll either be kept indefinitely or deleted after a period of time. Um, so we're gonna see here in a little bit how Office 365 has built-in tools to allow you to make these kind of decisions on an automated basis. Um, so one of those is labeling. So we can say if a document contains a certain, um, like a data format, so social security number, US driver's license, a UK passport number, that kind of thing, um, then it's going to flag it and it's going to say we automatically, based on the content of this file, um, apply this label to this document, which means that we're going to keep it for seven years. And then you decide, you know, what happens after that. There's going to be an option that says delete it after that time, or maybe we just move it to an archive, keep it for another one year, and then maybe we delete it. So I'll leave all those hard decisions up to you and your teams. Uh, typically, items in an archive do not show up in main search results. Uh, this isn't always true necessarily, but um, general practice or the most common feature that I would see in archives is that we're, we have them created, um, but not because we want people in there every day. An archive is kind of a side, a side project or something that isn't going to hit your communication site. It's not going to be the main feature of anything. Um, so, Archiving, a good example would be if you um, think back to folder structure days back when we had, <laughs> like, it, like it's gone, when we had um, folders that say do not delete or versions in the document name that said, you know, document version one, document version two. Um, those aren't so long ago, <laughs> actually. Um, so thinking about those, though, um, if you still have users who are doing that, who are putting the same file in their SharePoint environment under a different version number, so version 678, and someone searches for that document, they're going to get 678, but maybe the most recent version is 10, and based on your ranking model, maybe it shows up last in the search results. Um, so by not archiving and by making everything in the archive still searchable and equally ranked to everything in your main content or the relevant content, um, you're just muddying it up for your users. Uh, so understanding, um, you know, part of this is education, making sure your users understand that they can uh, set it so that their items do automatic versioning. And thankfully, you know, going forward, OneDrive and SharePoint, um, 0365 anyway, have it set to default where everything will be version history enabled. Um, so that'll help a little bit with that. And then the last piece of that is just educating people that, you know, this is enabled, and that means that you don't have to upload the same document with a different name uh, 10 times, and that you can easily go back and view or compare or restore a previous version. And that keeps your search results clear. The one that's going to show up is the last major published version. Um, so uh, items in an archive are often declared record, so we'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. Uh, work with others to determine an archive workflow. So chances are in IT, you don't know everything about compliance um, or um, retention, risk, that kind of stuff. So bringing the people who do know about that, so who could help you uh, set these policies, because you can always set something up and say, we're going to archive it for seven years based on your knowledge and understanding of the issue. But it could be that there's something you're not considering or that some underlying piece or some history that you don't quite have the whole picture of yet. So Whenever we're talking about policies, uh, where I work now, LMH Health, uh, we try to bring in the people who really understand the consequences of some of the things we're setting, because we're we're working with, um, you know, official documents and um, records, you know, that are 
historical and relevant to some people still. And at some point we may be audited or we may need to pull up those items from, you know, within the last seven years. So we just want to be careful when we're talking about automation in some of these tools. Okay, and if you remember uh, Dudley from Harry Potter, how can you forget him? Uh, but he's kind of the person I think about when I think about archiving without communicating. So if we're going to be moving stuff on people, moving cheese is a common expression, then we need to be telling people what's happening too. So um, go ahead and set your archive policies and your workflows up, but also let your users know what happens to their files based on the policy type or based on the document library location. Um, however you have it set up, just make sure people are aware because someday uh, Dudley's gonna go and he's gonna be looking for his 37 presents. All right, so we can automate um, archiving a little bit using retention policies. So this is where that gray area comes in. Some people say uh, retention policy, some people are talking about archiving, maybe they're talking about the same thing. So we're going to uh, talk about automating, automating archiving using retention policies. Uh, to me, this is the best, uh, most reliable way to do it. Uh, but you could also set up some kind of archiving with flow where you say, when a document meets a certain criteria, we're going to um, essentially move it or like create a copy of the most recent published version, put it in this other location. Maybe it's on demand, maybe it's on a regular basis, or like I said, when it meets certain criteria. Um, so an example here, if the status equals complete, create a file in archive, delete the original. Uh, you could always do manual as well. I wouldn't recommend this because uh, that's gonna be interpreted differently by different people. Um, it does give you full control. So if you do have people who are uh, weary of automation, um, hopefully you can um, alleviate some of their concerns, but you can't always. And uh, there may be cases where it does make sense to go through a small document library on a manual basis and archive when you're ready. Um, or stuff that just doesn't have a sensitive data type or something where you don't have to worry about manual archiving. So it's not ideal for large organizations, and uh, the big key here is that when you do manual policies, um, you're allowing people to interpret that differently. And it's not always even just different interpretation, but it's different uh, work ethics. So you may get people who, you know, every month they set time to make sure they're adhering to that policy and going through their files, and then you're going to have people who don't even think about it, um, and they don't do anything with the uh, files. Okay, so um, in... So this is an on-prem screenshot we're looking at. We need two libraries to set up an archive. You'd have your source and you'd have your archive. I, this would work with Microsoft Flow 2, where we're saying in this one library, which is our main um, consumption library, uh, when it meets a certain criteria or when I use the on-demand flow trigger, we're going to move it to the archive library where maybe search is disabled um, and maybe it's only read-only. Uh, so uh, if you wanna use the on-prem version of automation for this, you would need to activate the site feature called Content Organizer. Uh, and that's a site feature, so you can be uh, just a site collection admin is fine to be able to turn that on. Um, and with, as with any feature, uh, just a disclaimer that you probably wanna research it completely before you go clicking anything, or at least try it in your developer tenant first. Um, you don't wanna go and destroy a bunch of stuff on accident. Uh, and then uh, get your web service URL. So if you're not familiar with uh, this process, you can go to site settings and then content organizer settings to get that. So first you have to activate that feature, then you'll see this. Um, once you activate that, that's what gives you this setting and you just need to copy that. So then you'll see in central admin, so we're looking at an on-prem central admin, but this could be replicated for 0365 as well um, using the classic admin center. You're looking under records management on the left-hand side here. And then uh, you're gonna create a new send to location using that URL that you just copied. So right here, we're gonna paste that. And then some interesting options here um, would be that you could just move the item. So you just move it or you just copy it. Uh, but I like this one best, it's move and leave a link. So when you think about the people who do get um, upset about you moving them, their cheese, um, or when you're migrating a lot of files from shared drives into SharePoint or whatever project you're working with like that, if you can bridge the gap between where it was and where it's going, that'll help people a lot. And links take up a lot less space than you know some um, other options. So whenever, you know, with my shared drive example, when I move a bunch of files, I leave a link that says uh, move to SharePoint. And that's the only thing left in the file. The rest of the files are gone or hidden. Um, until we can be sure everything's good. And then they just double click that, takes them out to their SharePoint document library. 
kind of helps with that transition. And then at some point, again, with communication alongside that, we're going to say those links are going away. That crutch is coming out of that process. Um, so anyway, using this then, uh, what we're doing is establishing an archive. We're using that send to, oops, sorry about that. Using that send to URL there, and we're deciding how we're going to be moving it. Okay, so then the original document library, if you go to the library settings for that, this is where you do the final connection. So you're gonna say uh, the destination name. So from this library, we're creating a send to destination, which allows you manual archiving, and we're pasting the archive URL. So this is the name of the destination, and this is its URL. So um, archive advanced settings uh, is where you can disable search that we talked about. So just library settings, and then um, advanced settings. And then that just makes sure that when people are searching for things, they're not getting the 54th version of something when they really need the 100th. OK. Any questions before we keep going here? All righty. So uh, declaring records. So. Um, this is another feature, but this is going to be a site collection feature. So depending on your admin rights, um, you may or may not have that available to you. But declaring records basically just um, makes something read only, basically, is the simplest way to look at it. So um, declaring records marks an item as a record and prevents further edits or deletion. Uh, it does require the site collection feature uh, called in-place records management. So it's just site settings, site collection features. Um, if you don't see that in your site settings, you don't have the right uh, permissions set up for yourself. Uh, so then that's going to add a records app that auto sets docs to records. So you're going to see in your site contents then a new app called records. Uh, and then in your uh, document library settings, you're going to see library record declaration settings. This is a new one uh, that it would add. And you just decide, do you want to use the site collection default setting, which is do not allow manual declaration of records, always allow manual declaration of records, or never allow it. So if you're going to go with automation, then you probably want to go with do not allow or, or never allow manual, because that means that someone could go outside of the schedule or they could declare something before they're ready. Um, but sometimes it does make sense to say, hey, this is the final version of this um, file. We don't want anybody to make any further modifications. Let's declare it a record and get it going on its retention policy. Um, and then you can have a trigger set up that says, when an item is declared a record, ABC. So you have other processes that are tied to this declaration of a record. Um, you could also have a document library that is exclusively meant to have just declared records, which means that if you're going to be moving files into it, um, you can check this box, and then anything that's added is automatically a record. So maybe this is your archive. Okay, so your disclaimer here is that declared records cannot be moved. So if you're going to set them there, I hope they want to uh, retire there. Uh, but they can be copied. So even though you can't move it, edit it, or delete it, or delete it, people could make a copy of it if they needed to. All right, so retention. So we're preserving what must be preserved. We talked about um, archiving, so the process of moving or copying or uh, preserving a file in that way. But retention, we're talking a little bit more about um, regulation. We're talking about rules that are in place by the state or by your organization um, or by any kind of industry standard that says we have to keep this record for seven years. How can we make sure that that happens? OK, so for ministry employees, aka O365 admins, we can go to the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. And bear with me with these screenshots because they're going to be a little bit different from reality. We can see the old icons even there. So um, let me skip past some of this and get you to the real stuff. OK. OK, so I'm in the Compliance Center. So uh, this is a live um, example, so we don't have to worry about old screenshots or anything. Um, what we're looking at, or to get here, actually, if you want to go into your Admin Center here, that does look similar to what you saw on the screenshot. And then this is just called Compliance. So look for that center. Um, and I did see that this is the classic view of Compliance now. And they're making a modern view, or there already is a modern view. So 
good luck when you go and check out your tenant to see what's actually there, <laughs> but just know that you're looking for the Compliance Center. Uh, so here we are. Uh, data Governance is the tab that we're looking for. So just to give you an idea, when you first click on Compliance, it might look something like this. Oh, and here we go. So it's saying the new Security Center and new Compliance Center. Um, so that's the modern. It looks completely different. But get to Compliance first. And then on the left, we're looking for that Data Governance. And then underneath there, so we can see some familiar words here. We've got archiving and retention. We're going to go to retention. And then I just want to show you some of this stuff's already set up. So let's just say we're new to this tenant, new to this company, and we want to see what's already in place so that we can start our discussion there before we create additional policies. Maybe we just need to modify or revise what's already there. Uh, so I work in a hospital. I'm interested in medical records retention policy. I'm going to stick that one. And I'll just get a preview first. This is a very SharePointy experience. Um, so I'm looking here. I can see that the status is on. It's just a toggle on off, super easy. Uh, name of the policy. Um, it's applied to content if it contains personal identifying information uh, or medical terms. And then it applies to Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint sites, and O365 groups. Uh, the retention policy itself says to detect the content that contains sensitive info and keep it for seven years. Um, the tricky thing about talking about some of these policies is that I can't demo seven years unless you guys are free for the next seven years and just want to hang out for a bit. Um, so we just kind of have to trust that this is going to work. Um, and you can always try it in your own tenants at a much shorter time interval, but I don't think any of us have seven years currently. So we'll just keep going here. I'm going to click on edit though. Let's dive a little bit deeper and see what's in this policy. So locations apply. I'm going to skip to that tab. And what I really like, um, especially with the introduction of Teams, and that's not showing up here, but in some of these retention policies that we set up, we'll see Teams included here. We'll see that we could limit it just to Exchange if you're the Exchange administrator. Um, and of course, for my focus, it's typically SharePoint. But knowing that we can apply the same policy across all of these apps without having to recreate it means that we can uh, consolidate the team that's talking about it too. Uh, we don't have to worry about bringing in, you know, three different separate meetings about these different apps and the different policies, we're just going to apply something blanket. So uh, we could do specific sites. Uh, same with Teams. When you're doing a Teams policy, you can choose specific Teams. Um, and then OneDrive, we can choose specific accounts or exclude accounts. So pretty powerful there. And then the policy settings themselves. So we're looking for Social Security numbers and then DEA numbers medical terms. So they've got a library, kind of like a, a term store or a data dictionary kind of thing set up where they're looking at these certain sets of terms. And then down here is where we do the retention actions. We're saying for seven years, do you want to delete it after this time? And that's what I was mentioning. Um, this is a conversation you'd be having with your team to say, does this match with our you know, legal requirement? Um, because this one was already built, it, you know, it could be that they did their research ahead of time, but it's never a bad idea to double check because things change over time. Um, and then this one, don't retain the content, just delete it if it's older than seven years. So lots of options there for customizing. And I'm not going to change my or save my changes. Oop, did I click the wrong thing? There we go. Okay, let's create a new one though, so you can see what it's like from scratch. Okay, so our new policy is called test policy. Oops. Then we're going to do next. Okay, so our set settings. So this is in a little bit different order from what we were just looking. How long do you want to retain it? Do you want to retain it forever? Um, I personally don't know of a lot of situations that would require that, but you could. And then retain it based on when it was created or when it was last modified. So for me, in most of the business cases that I'm working with people on, it's going to be from when it was last modified. Um, creation doesn't necessarily matter in a lot of the documents that I work with. Uh, it's just when was the last you know, edit made or how long has it been stale. Uh, so then after that time, do you want to delete it? We click on the little tooltip here. It gives you a lot of information that lets you know exactly what's going to happen. Okay, and then no just delete um, content that's older than one year. Again, based on created or modified. And then there are um, advanced retention settings. So we could say detect content that contains sensitive info or content that contains specific words or phrases. So let's go ahead and try that. And then you'll see we could say if it contains you know, project XYZ, if that shows up in one of these documents, we do additional steps. So let's do next here. 
And then here we go, we can do all locations or let me choose specific. So we've got our O365 groups where we can choose uh, specific groups or exclude them. And then the same three we saw previously. And then next, and then this is just our final thing where we say, are we ready to put this into action? So it's not too hard. Um, I think it's a lot simpler in O365 than it would be in um, an on-premise instance where you're relying on SharePoint Designer or a Visual Studio or some other way to get you through these long durations of seven years. So, but if anybody has experience with doing that and has had luck with it, you know, it's always interesting to share those stories because some people may not see Office 365 still for a long time. Um, so sharing your success stories in um, retention and archiving when you are limited and don't have some of these modern tools is really valuable to people. So that might be your start into blogging. Okay. Let's see where we were. Okay, so there's, um, let's see, if we go to our labels. Okay, so we're still in the same compliance center. I'm going under classifications and to labels. Um, some interesting stuff here. So uh, out of the box, they just have personal, general, internal, highly confidential, and this uh, specific developer tenant. Let's just create a new one. Okay, and this stuff changes, so bear with me, we've got Test name, test tooltip, I'll skip that. Encryption is off, interesting option there. Content marking, so um, if you do have like a watermark that you wanna apply, like confidential or something to a document, you could put on content marking. And that just means that if something matches the parameters that you're setting up, put confidential across it um, or add a footer or header. And this was actually possible in on-prem as well. Um, I've never gotten it to work, but it is there. So um, just know that this just looks a little bit different. Endpoint data loss prevention. Um, you can only set up endpoint DLP capabilities offered by WIP. Um, so um, DLP settings for Office 365 apps will soon be available. So just um, read some of those things. And it's kind of exciting to share that with your team that, hey, we don't have to develop something custom soon, whatever that means, hopefully not too long. <laughs> we'll have something there for us. Um, auto labeling, so um, depending on your license, you might be able to use Azure or something to do auto labeling and then review your settings. So I'm gonna go back. And you'll notice we have two tabs up here. So we just went through sensitivity, retention. So we'll see a few more here. Uh, medical records retention policy, we'll look at that one again. So this isn't the retention policy, this is just a label this time. So what's tagging those documents? Okay, so we've got um, just a few options, not a lot there, but check those out in your own. Oops. Okay, and if you're creating a new label for the first time, something that's gonna be applied to these sensitive documents or files matching, um, you've got the same options. You've got your name, file plan descriptors, maybe. There we go. So I don't have any of this set up, but you could uh, go through and check it out on yours. But the important thing to take away here is that um, you're basically setting up a big workflow. You're saying, if something contains something, flag it with this label. And with that label, what action do you wanna take? Does it trigger a retention policy? Does it apply a watermark to that item? Um, and then your sensitive info types, like some of the stuff is just out of the box. So you've got your medical records. So here we go, your ABA routing number. These are all things built into O365 that you could use as a label or with your labels and retention policies. So your passport numbers, you've got your social security numbers, credit card number formats. It's just incredible, the stuff that's already there available to use. And chances are you already have policies and you just need to create them digitally and apply it in your O365 environment. Okay. So we just did retention policies there, but if you're not an O365 admin, and some of us aren't, in fact, at LMH I mentioned we're still on 2016, so we have to think about this a little bit differently. Uh, we do plan on going hybrid, so this you know, will change for us soon, but in the meantime, how can you do something still? Uh, so let's create a retention policy um, on-prem. You could also do this in O365, so if you are there, just know that this is available to you as well. 
So I'm going to back out here. Okay, so here's just a document library, um, and we're just going to go through some of the settings and see how you could apply retention and archiving. Okay, whoops. Okay, so I'm going to settings and library settings, and of course if you're on-prem this will look a little bit different if you don't have the modern experience with 2019, um, but just you know how to get to library settings, I hope. So then our information rights management here is the link that uh, will get us what we need. Okay. So here we go. Um, this is a little bit different. So depending on which model you're using or which uh, version you're on, so 2016 looks different from this. This is the O365 uh, document library settings. We've got created permission policy title, permission policy description, um, and then some neat options here. So stop restricting access to the library on a certain day. So maybe you want to lock it down temporarily. Um, do you want to allow users to print? This is new, um, at least to me. Allow viewers to write on a copy of the downloaded document. Interesting. And then verifying credentials. So some neat stuff there. I wonder if I can get you, I'll show you my slides because this is still more 2016. I don't have a tenant set up that'll help you. But if you go to information management policy settings, um, you'll see there when you're in library settings, you get this um, list-based retention schedule. So you get two options where you can set up a retention policy on a certain content type. So content types are kind of like the templates of document libraries and lists. So you could say uh, for the, so the specific content type, so for um, a time off request or something, uh, let's say this retention policy applies. Or you could do it library and folder based, but if you go with library and folder based, it's gonna trump anything that's based on content type. So um, library and folder would be a specific case, so maybe an archive or your uh, record declaration library. And then your uh, content types would be just for a use across your entire site collection. And this is where we start to see the value of using content types in our tenants, because um, rather than creating you know, the same or similar content types in multiple sites across our tenant, um, if we create them at the top level and we use the same content types across these sites, then something like this, this list-based retention schedule, makes it so easy just to do something uniform. Um, so anyway, in the specific document library, we can choose between those options. And then uh, we get some options that allow us to enable retention uh, where we can do stages. So if you're familiar with SharePoint designer workflows, so you can do stages where it's like keep this for seven days, then email a user, then delete it. And I wanted to show you if you do have on-prem or SharePoint designer. So here's just an example of a workflow. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but you've got a 2010 workflow. That's the only requirement if you're going to use that in a retention policy for a library. Um, it's got to be 2010, and it's got to be able to be manually started. So basically, this just allows you to say, you know, after a week, email the person who created it, or email the person who last modified it, and say, hey, we plan on setting this as a record in 10 days unless you make a change to the document or modify it or update this dropdown or something. Um, so that helps you automate and facilitate some of that conversation. It also gives you a chance to include a link to a policy or to, to include education about the process in place at your company to let them know why they're getting that message. Okay, and so that workflow, that 2010 workflow, would just be a stage you could add here. I feel like, whoops, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, that must have changed for 0365, but look in your version if you are on-prem. Um, it was 2013 and 2016. In my experience, you'll see something here for, um, oh, what was it called? Information management policy settings. So look for that, um, and that's where you're gonna be setting that up. Okay, and so those stages we just talked about, here's an example of what that's gonna look like when you click on it. So you've got uh, the stages based off of creation date or modified. And then it could be years, but it could also be days. So you could say, after an item was created, seven days, say, you know, send an email, is this the final version declared as a record? That's extreme, but just uh, take the idea here. And then you get some options after that. So after this time-based um, trigger, we're going to move it to a recycle bin or transfer it to another location, or what I was just showing you, we're gonna start a workflow. And that allows us to include that communication step, which I always think is really important. If we're gonna be moving cheese, let's let people know we're moving cheese. Um, so that's the start a workflow. 
um, you could say, you know, conditionally skip to a different stage depending on, like, if this document already is declared a record, skip a stage. Okay, so if you're SharePoint Online or O365, there is one downside. Um, you don't have the grim, but timer jobs only run weekly and they can't be adjusted, so any retention policies you do put in place in that way that I just showed you uh, won't be effective immediately. So um, if you're on-prem, though, you can always trigger jobs whenever you want uh, manually from um, central admin. All right, so what next? Uh, we're at a place where we can start thinking about what to do with some of this. Um, a lot of this content is just, you know, drinking from the fire hose. And because it's so different, because O365 and or Microsoft 365 is evolving so rapidly, uh, this stuff is changing a lot and we're getting new features. And some of the stuff we thought we were limited to is now expanding and we're seeing that we're able to do cross app stuff. Um, and we're changing the way our teams are structured too, like not just digitally, but in the IT office. Maybe the Exchange administrator now is, you know, almost, you know, right there next to the SharePoint administrator, and they become O365 administrators because they do so much overlap. Um, so we're seeing teams change. We're seeing the way we collaborate change because of the tools we have, um, and that's just starting conversations. So if anything out of this presentation, what I hope you're taking away is ideas about conversations that should be happening at your organization today. Uh, related to you know best practices and secure content um, retention policies that are in place and how you're enforcing those with the tools you have um, so it's not goodbye um, any presentation you attend is always just um, a chance to get started on something new all right so i'd recommend if you don't have a governance group or an advisory council or something make that your next step go ahead and get some group together that's not just it um, so like I said, include compliance, include risk management, whoever you have that can help you with some of the more tricky situations and get them together on a monthly basis. Or if it's a project-based timeline, get them together every other week and work on something together. Um, because when you get those outside voices, they learn what's available as a tool to them that maybe they didn't think was available and maybe you can get rid of a vendor solution. Um, but then you also get the insight from their arenas, you know, what's important to them and what's an absolute requirement for their department to be able to implement. Um, so then you can think about setting up an archive if you um, would benefit from an archive. If not, maybe you just declare records within the library the item exists. So you know both of those are possible now. Would it be beneficial to provide an option to make something read-only by declaring it a record or by um, changing item level permissions, which I wouldn't recommend? <laughs> but you can do whatever works to achieve your goal and whatever's manageable by the size of team you have. I know some of us are kind of a one-person team and some of this seems astronomical. Uh, so it becomes even more important to make sure we're having conversations with more than just our own groups and getting help when we can get it. Uh, so then uh, document your process and workflows. So thinking about that communication that I keep mentioning, um, end users want to know what's going on with their stuff. Uh, so take the time to document any decisions you make, make a Visio diagram, make a PowerPoint presentation, send out an update. It doesn't really matter as long as you're providing an opportunity for people to see the changes you're making, because these are typically big changes. We're talking about how we're doing content strategy, which changes the look and feel, the organization, the access to, the permissions and capabilities of end users. These are big things. Uh, so just make sure that's documented and accessible to your users and then decide what should be done with your existing content. So that first big migration I did from a completely HTML internet into Office 365, working with that existing content was overwhelming. It's just there's so much out there. So where do you start? Um, of course, people talk about eating an elephant. It's just one bite at a time. Uh, but this might be a little bit different for you. Maybe you can do some blanket policies where you say if something is 15 years old, which I'm sure is out there somewhere, um, you can just go ahead and send it straight to archive. Maybe it doesn't even reach your O365 tenant. So start those discussions about old content, then get into the, the more modern stuff. So say, what do we do with the content that people are consuming today? Do we only allow one version? Do we you know, even talk about versioning? Do we turn that on? Um, it should be turned on by default in a lot of modern environments, but for some of the older on-premises environments and tenants. Um, those are going to need to be manually set up. So is it blanket across your organization or are you setting it up one by one? Because that's going to affect your user experience and consistency. Um, and the last thing you want is someone to expect that version is turned on and rely on that feature and then find out later when they need it that it's not turned on. 
Um, so then uh, learn the latest in content management and retention from, now this is getting old because we're about to get up to another Ignite, so watch for more stuff on this. Uh, but you can always go to YouTube, search for content management and retention. Um, I think I have a link on the next slide. Yeah, so just screenshot this or take a picture or watch the recording later to get these links. Or again, just Google it. <laughs> it's a search world. Uh, so look for uh, Ignite content management and Ignite retention and watch these videos about, um, you know, unveilings of features and see where some of this started or conversations that sparked some of the changes we're seeing today. Um, some additional resources I like to mention in some of my presentations include ShareGate. So when we're talking about moving a ton of files or moving, you know, even just a little bit to save you time, uh, ShareGate saves me time all the time where I can just say, move this entire library to this other location, um, which really just makes a copy of it. And then you can delete the original um, or move an entire site. So maybe you're going to archive an entire site, move it to a different site collection. Um, with the uh, introduction of hub sites, we're seeing you know, a lot of ease come of this now where we can just change something's association so we don't have to worry about moving the entire site. So some of these options, again, depending on if you're 0365 are a little bit different. Um, and then all of my tutorials that I write are on SharePointLibrarian.com. So if you run into issues, maybe I've run into it before, um, I try to always put my solutions out there. Um, so my posts are kind of random. It's like, ooh, I got this error, and then I want to write it up for you and show you how I got around it. Um, Download SharePoint Designer if you are on-prem. It's a great way to set up those 2010 workflows. It's the only way to set those up if you plan on using those retention stages for those document libraries. And then uh, check out, so uh, Teams has a great admin center, so check that out in Central Admin. Um, and then read about security and compliance for them. Um, just learn about your options there because we're seeing it introduced slowly into some of the things we were talking about today. Um, so check out the roadmap, see what's going to be you know, more intertwined in the future and learn what you can do because Teams is still um, very new to a lot of organizations and there might be more risk there than we realize sometimes just because there's not quite an understanding of how it fits into the whole grand scheme. All right, so that's all I have. Um, I'll look to Shadid here for any questions that are coming up. Again, you can uh, contact me through any of these methods, LinkedIn, Twitter, or email, um, and watch for the Lawrence SharePoint user group. We do a monthly webinar. Um, Shadid's spoken for us uh, once or twice, and we have some other great speakers, um, a lot of MVPs, and we like to introduce new speakers. So if anybody there is interested in uh, getting some experience or you're passionate about a topic, uh, reach out and let me know. We'd love to have you for a special lunch hour presentation or for one of our monthly events. Um, whatever you think people would want to hear about. And even earlier I mentioned if you have a, an on-premises environment where you've worked through something really challenging, chances are someone else could benefit from that info too. So if you just want to share a case study or a, something that you worked through, um, that's always more than welcome too. All right, so I don't see questions. I'm going to turn Shadid on for voice here. Okay, Shadid, you're on. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, Nate, there's a, a lot of uh, good uh, food for thought. I like the, uh, the concept of content uh, management as the, uh, the umbrella. Kind of uh, gives a, a, a good picture. And of course, everything under, under the umbrella can range from uh, document management to uh, people strategy. And the list goes on and on. The uh, the book that you provided, uh, content uh, strategy for the web, is a great resource as well that uh, I'm definitely going to look into and uh, and read. So for those of you who are uh, tuning in online, uh, thank you for uh, joining us and uh, participating in uh, this session. Lots of uh, great resources. The session has been recorded for on-demand goodness. And on behalf of uh, the group that's here within the room, as well as those online, thank you, Nate, for your session and uh, delivering value to Baltimore SharePoint community. All right, thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Welcome.